Well, like uh, Terry said, my name is Andrew Fillingham. I'm with Ampere. We're going to talk about just some basics of your EV safety and the different features you can add to your car and should be aware of in order to be safe while you do your builds. Whether this is a build that's a complete kit that you're buying or you're doing the full kit yourself. The last 12 years, I've been doing working on autonomous vehicles, EVs, hybrid EVs, that giant 100 ton dump truck we made autonomous, so reverse engineered that. That was a fun day. And now at Ampere, we do a lot of testing with our DeLorean, which is kind of our test mule. A little bit about Ampere, we do kind of the full pack. We do the full powertrain. It's ready to go install into your car. We do all the HV cables, low voltage cables. Me specifically, I focus on the software, very focused on fault detection and fault mitigation. As most of y'all know, doing conversions is there's always something, something to do and something to buy. Hopefully with the safety features that we go over that will maybe protect some of your components and also protect the people working on the vehicle. We're gonna talk about high voltage interlock loops, so HVIL. We're gonna talk about isolation monitoring or ground fault detection, discharge circuits, connectors, thermal management, which you don't really get into until you get the car together, how to store it, and what does a VCU do in your car. So HVIL is just a simple loop that goes through all your high voltage components. It's a low voltage loop. It can be a constant voltage. It can be some fancy signal. It's pretty simple. If the loop is broken, you don't turn that component on. Just to give an example, this is our junction box, which does all the high voltage connections. So it connects the battery to the rest of the vehicle, to all your accessories. The green kind of circuit, that is what our loop looks like. So when all those connectors are plugged in, this green loop is connected. Our VCU ensures that that connection is there. This way, if you're working on the car and you forgot to plug in your DC to DC, that connector is not exposing high voltage to the person working on it. You'll see oftentimes there's four pins. Two of those little tiny pins is actually your HVAL. So that is just a loop that tells you whether or not that connector is plugged in or not. When you're doing your build and you actually wanna implement this in your car, there's a couple of different ways you can do this. For, I would say, simpler builds, so you maybe have just a motor, you have a battery, and wanting to make sure that if that's unplugged, or if anything's unplugged, it doesn't turn on, your contactors don't close, you can just power your contactors through the HVL loop. It's simple, it's effective, it won't work if something's unplugged. Once you have more and more components, you kind of have to add in a controller that monitors this HVL. You may even have multiple loops going on your car that need to be monitored. Just that's a kind of high level of what HVL is. Another thing that you want to definitely have in all of your builds, and that's our stance, is ground fault detection or isolation monitoring. What is it? All isolation monitoring is doing is it's telling you how connected your high voltage is to your low voltage or your chassis. In an ideal world, they're completely separated. The isolation monitor tells you how connected they are. This is measured in ohms per volt, and the magic number that everyone wants to be above is 500 ohms per volt. If you're above that, it's considered safe. If you're below that, the vehicle should not start up. Isolation monitoring prevents a lot of things, a lot of bad things from happening. It protects your power electronics, so you can fry your car basically if you have bad isolation. And it can also expose the driver or whoever's working the car to a voltage when they come in contact with the chassis. From the T2C user guide from EV Controls, you know, they mention the results of poor isolation, blowing up controllers to damaging your Tesla inverter boards, frying the component, you gotta buy a new one and try again. So without this simple device, if you don't build your high voltage correctly, you can damage all your components. I took a log of what this looks like in an actual drive. It's a lot of squiggles, but basically it's just to show that your isolation varies as you drive. It varies with temperature, it varies with like, how hot your batteries are, the weather, but the main thing is you just want it to be above that 500 ohms per volt. In our cars, we know everything's correctly hooked up and working well when we're actually at that 10,000 ohms per volt range. Whenever we get below 1,000, we actually set a warning to tell the user something's not right. So we're operating about 30 times above what the standard is. Isolation can happen from very little things. A coolant leak can come up through a bolt on your cooling plate and just a single drop of water is enough to drop your isolation below that 500 ohms per volt limit. 
but an isolation monitor can actually detect this. It's actually impressive of how well it tells you you have a problem very early. Basically, there, there's normally three connections you make. You connect to the high voltage positive, negative, and then the isolation monitor connects to your chassis. Once you have those, it can report the isolation either over CAN, some kind of communication network, or it can even provide digital outputs so you can turn on some lamps for the driver. This is what the Thunderstruck ground fault monitoring example is. This is how they suggest the wire in their system. And you can see that in the, the blue is your isolation monitor, and it just has two connections to your high voltage and a connection to ground, and it provides the ability to turn on some warning circuits if something goes wrong. You can even power your contactors off of this. A lot of times these go in your battery boxes so that you always have a isolation monitor where there's a high voltage battery. Normally isolation monitoring should always be happening. It should always be working on in the car, especially once you do maintenance on the car, that's always should be on your checkoff list. What is the isolation? Did I put everything back together? Did a leak happen? Is there water? Next big thing that always you want to be aware of is the high voltage energy that's on your bus when you shut down. There's a lot of capacitors in your high voltage electronics to filter out noise, imp improve their performance. When you shut down, unless you have what's called a high voltage discharge circuit, that high voltage will persist for minutes, it can persist for an hour, it just kind of depends. If you don't dissipate this energy actively without a discharge resistor, you can have high voltage present for minutes or hours. With properly doing a discharge resistor, our system goes down below 50 volts in 0.1 seconds, I think. On shutdown, you're safe. Here is an example of what our vehicles, our systems do. The blue is your high voltage. The orange is the, the discharge resistor turning on and off. So when you shut down, the discharge resistor, when it's safe, turns on and our high voltage drops to four volts in 0.1 seconds. But if you don't have a junction box that has this high voltage discharge resistor, a lot of motors have this built in that you can actually configure or use as an option. There's our, our junction boxes. This is where we have our discharge resistor and that gets connected when we shut down the vehicle. It's always good to know and also tell the people working on your car or your build, if high voltage is live, does it have active discharge? And always, if you don't know, just put on your high voltage gloves and measure. Okay, so next we'll talk about connectors. They're complicated. So connectors, high voltage connectors specifically, they have a lot of components. And also when you build battery boxes, you kind of have to think about how easy is this box to take apart? Is it just one latch and you have the whole thing open? When you're building your batteries or building your high voltage components, you, know, you wanna strive for IP67 enclosures so no water gets in. It is safe from dust, exposure to, and also for people not to get into them, right? We go with the approach of everything should take two actions. You'll see this on high voltage connectors. It takes two actions open and that's a good rule of thumb. If you can do it in one action, then it's not necessarily a safe enclosure or connector for high voltage. If anything can crawl in there and a bug can get in there and short your system, then your enclosure needs to be updated. So a lot of these components that you add into your system, are they're all gonna have different ratings. This matters a lot if you're doing like a 120 volt build versus a 400 volt build or even higher. It's always important to not just reuse the same contactors or connectors across those builds, you wanna double check these are rated for what you're trying to do. A good example is like a pre-charge resistor. Unless you have a really big pre-charge resistor for all your stuff, the same one that's rated for the 120 volt system is probably not rated for the 400 volt system. It can slowly fail over time uh, or it'll fail instantly. Uh, just to give an example, the connectors that are on our battery boxes, their specs are you know, minus 40 to 100 C. They can do 100, 500 amps continuous and they're rated for 1000 volts as well as we have the IP67 rating on them. One of the big things we see is actually crimping. You can get away with a bad crimp for low voltage, but if, if you get a bad crimp for high voltage, the stakes are higher. If you're not using the right tool to crimp these, these terminals on the high voltage connectors, you can cause a short to chassis. Uh, this could happen while active. We spend a lot of time making sure we have the right crimpers and it is a process. You can always ask around and someone probably knows what you should do there. There's a lot of parts that go into this little connector and you have to do that 10 times or multiple times for all of your components. So it's very easy for one of these to not be right. And that's 
kind of all it takes for either your vehicle not to work or there just to be a pending problem. One of the issues we actually see a lot is with these outer ferrules. So we just see a lot of isolation faults and kind of issues pop up out of nowhere. Just to give you a good example, that cable below that connector just pulled straight out of the high voltage connector because it wasn't crimped correctly. Along with that, you can see that there's strands of shielding just floating around. So the, the ferrules weren't used there to hold that down. Try to get the right tools for high voltage connectors, check the ratings. Once you kind of get that all set up, then it's pretty easy just to follow the process. Once you get your build all together, you're gonna start looking at thermal management. And this varies quite a bit based on, is this a day driver? Is this your car? Or are you gonna put on a racetrack? The most temperamental things in your car are your batteries and probably your inverter that heats up the quickest. Batteries, they really like to be in that basically zero degrees C to 50 C. During driving, we've seen like Tesla likes to operate their batteries around 30 degrees C for just driving. And actually fast charge, they bump it up to 50 degrees C. There's a couple of different configurations you can do with your cooling. And again, this is kind of based on what the purpose of your build is. The simplest is you just have passive cooling. It takes a long time for batteries to heat up. If you're not driving that long of a time, then this is actually a good approach. It's simple and there's no coolant involved. You may have forced air cooling like what the original Toyota Prius design had, or you can have passive cooling like the Nissan Leaf setup. You still have to adhere to the battery temperature limits. The one downside to this, other than not being able to cool quickly, is you can actually get a lot of temperature variation across cells. Okay, you're gonna be driving this car quite a bit. You have a big, big battery pack. You're gonna add in some type of liquid cooling, heating as well. So normally you have a pump, your coolant loop that goes through your battery box. So you'll have some type of high voltage heater if you need to heat the batteries. This configuration works for, I'd say, like 90% of builds. Now, if you're gonna start doing some racing and then you're doing fast charging and going back on the racetrack, you'll need to actually do some active cooling. And this is when you start getting into using an AC compressor to chill the battery and you can actually get subambient cooling with this approach. It's a little more complicated because you're gonna have a three-way valve that will switch between normal cooling and heating to subambient cooling and you have to add in that valve and also the additional AC loop. Then we get into more of the OEM level of cooling which has lots of valves and pumps and this is more now we want to do full thermal management. We want to take the heat from our motor to warm our battery on startup. We want to be able to actively cool it with AC if it gets too hot. Lots of switching involved here. You get the benefit of higher efficiency and also you're using the heat that your vehicle already produces to heat the battery. Now, if you're doing motorsports, there's some extra requirements. A lot of them require two main things. One is LED indicators and one is being able to shut off high voltage, so high voltage switch. For the LED indicators, if you're doing racing, you want to make sure you have normally two indicators, one internal to the driver, one external to the driver. And this is just if for some reason you get on a wreck on the track, you know if there's high voltage on the system. They require that you have disconnects. If you're doing your own build yourself, this is probably a good idea anyways. You can, that way you can always disconnect high voltage with an e-stop or a push of a button or a switch. Then long-term storage. So if you're doing a build and you have some batteries that are gonna sit for greater than a month, you wanna make sure you put the batteries in an environment that will let them last for a long time and not damage them. Disconnect 12 volts so there's no 12 volt drain and you don't kill your 12 volt battery. If you have a high voltage disconnect, go ahead and use it. Make sure it's in a nice dry environment, somewhere in the temperature range of minus 13 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. If the SOC drops below 10%, you should charge it up to 30%. So finally, you have all of these features, components integrated in your vehicle. For simpler builds, you can actually integrate these in directly to indicators and also your, like your contactors. Once it gets a little more complicated, you're gonna see that you have some type of vehicle control unit or a supervisor or some type of hardware and software that is controlling and monitoring all these systems. And this vehicle control unit, one of its main roles is to start up the car correctly, shut down, but also keep you safe. VCU may control contactors, 
control your pre-charge and discharge, pedal to torque request mapping to the motor. It'll monitor your HVIL like we talked about and control all of your high voltage components. It should always be monitoring. It should always be reporting. And most importantly, it's always acting on these faults. If a fault happens, depending on the severity, what should the VCU do? A BMS could do this job. The name doesn't really matter. You just have some type of hardware or software that's playing this safety role. For isolation, a VCU will, when you turn on the vehicle, the VCU will continuously monitor what isolation is. And then it'll check, hey, are you above this magic value of 500 ohms per volt? In our vehicle, we have a, a warning if it drops below 1,000. Normal for us in our kit is like 10,000 ohms per volt. If it drops below 1,000, there might be an issue. We'll set a lamp to tell the user. We'll start reducing power a little bit. And then most importantly, we'll actually log the fault and set a DTC. So you can actually read the trouble code after the fact and you don't have to know it's happening right then and there. You can actually see that it happened after your drive. Now, if that isolation starts dropping too low and it gets below that, the next action is you still set that lamp, but now you need to shut down high voltage and you need to do it safely, not while you're going 60 down the highway. Just an example, here's the OBD2 faults in our vehicle to signify that this happened. For HVIL, it's a similar thing. Start up the vehicle, the very first thing we do is we check HVIL. If HVIL is not good, we don't have everything plugged in, we're not gonna start up the car. If that happens, we'll set a lamp, we'll prevent contactors from closing so no high voltage gets onto the bus, and then we'll log this fault. Going to thermal management, when you're, for instance, in this example, it's batteries, but it's the same thing for inverters, same thing for motor. The VCU will continuously monitor those temperatures. For example, if our batteries get above 50 degrees C, which they shouldn't, we'll start maxing out our pump and fan to try to get as much cooling as possible. Once we get a few degrees higher, we start reducing power to try to prevent the batteries getting any hotter, but still letting the vehicle drive. And if for some reason the temperature gets above 55 C, then we take the most extreme action where we set the lamp, we tell the user it's overheating, we shut down the vehicle when it gets into a safe state. Uh, similar for discharge, so this is mainly on shutdown. Most time when you shut down on our system because we have active discharge, you know that no high voltage is present, but if that high voltage discharge were to fail, the user needs to know so that they don't go disconnecting high voltage cables expecting there to be no high voltage. So that's kind of a fire hose of maybe all the safety features you'll see in EV conversions. And the reason why they're there is just, we wanna protect the people working on the cars and we wanna protect the components that are in the cars. You don't even notice them when the car is running good, but when something goes wrong, these are the things that can protect you and protect your build, especially while you're working on it. We have an EV basic series the legacy EV trainings. The information is out there. There's some good training now to where if you're buying a kit that does some of this for you, does it actually do the things that you need?